Hey, everybody. In today's episode, it's myself, Ben Harrison, who's been on before, and Nicole, who's also been on before. Both of these people I work with on a day-to-day basis, very educated, and they come on the show today to discuss codependency. Codependency is, in fact, a buzzword. It is used a lot And we are here today to tell you what codependency actually is. How can you spot it in your own life, what you can do about it, and ultimately how you're going to grow from understanding your codependency. So we cover that and so much more in this episode. Enjoy the show. Ready? Yeah. Here we are, Real Recovery Talk. I am your host, Tom Conrad, in today's episode. We have a blast from the past. He's been on a couple times. (laughs) Benjamin Harrison. Hey. Hi, everybody. (laughs) Hello, Ben. And we also have Nicole. Hello, Nicole. Hi, everybody. First things first. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for tuning in on the podcast app, whichever one that you choose to use. And thank you for watching on YouTube. In the end, if you have any comments, questions, or concerns, you can always reach us. Info at Real Recovery Talk. Dot com. Again, that's info at realrecoverytalk.com, and ultimately we want to help you turn your mess into your message, right, peeps? That's yes. right. Also, go to realrecoverytalk.com slash guide. There you're going to find some guides and assessments that you can download for free. All you have to do is put your email in, scan the guide, see which one aligns with your needs, download it, print it off, put it on your refrigerator, read it, fill it out, whatever you have to do, <laughs> make sure you utilize it. Uh, I know I've downloaded things in the past and I've printed them and they've found their way into some sort of drawer and only to find them a few months later and like, oh, I wish I remembered I had that. Mm -hmm. Uh, So again, realrecoverytalk.com slash guide to get that stuff. And you can also go to realrecoverytalk.com. On the homepage, you're going to see a little hyperlink that says schedule a call. Click that, pick a time, and you can speak to either myself Ben or Dr. Tambini, Ben Bueno, to clarify, uh, we'll take 10 or 15 minutes and talk about your situation and see if we can help you in any capacity. So good job, Tom. All right. Mm-hmm. How you doing, Ben? I'm doing well. Thank you. How Get are that you? mic a little closer to you. There you go. Doing well. How are you? Good. Thank you. <laughs> um, you all right? You yeah, start- I'm doing great. I'm glad that you invited me back. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, hello, Nicole. Hello, Thomas. <laughs> Nicole is uh, obviously, you know, we're we work together. Yes. So. And now no, we don't have we all Nicole. Yes. Well, yeah, but <laughs> touche. Nicole's like, oh, I want to be on the podcast with Ben. <laughs> <laughs> it's a dynamic duo. Oh, there you go. I mean, come so. on. There's going to be some laughs, some giggles, probably, and uh, mm-hmm. some serious talking points. And but we're going to get through this, and we're going to get it get through this together. There you go. And uh, in today's episode, what we're going to be discussing is codependency, and this is a uh, mm-hmm. kind of a buzzword. People oftentimes use it uh, <clears throat> seemingly every other sentence, and sometimes you can play it out. So we're going to give you what codependency actually is. Um, And how it normally plays out in family dynamics and how it can really wreak havoc on the family system. Uh, So, But with that being said, um, these two are much more well-versed in codependency than I am because I, for fact, am not codependent. I don't care for people. I don't like people. And therefore, (laughs) I'm not codependent. (laughs) Totally kidding. (laughs) Totally kidding. Unbelievable. So, anyways, all right, who wants to kick us off? One of you two? Ben, go for it. Sure. You know, it's hard for me not to talk, it's hard for me to talk about codependency without talking about my own personal journey with Mm. codependency. Um, So I'm going to be doing a lot of disclosure in my journey and the work that I've done on myself with codependency. Um, Mm. But you're right, to piggyback off of you, that word gets tossed around a lot and a lot of people don't really know what it means. They think they know what it means. They think that I need you to feel okay about me. And that's only a symptom, I believe, of codependency. That's not codependency by definition. I've come to learn that codependency by definition for me is not being properly emotionally nurtured in my childhood. And therefore, that has grown tentacles throughout my life. Mm. 
through my childhood, through my adolescent years, through my young adulthood, into my adulthood. Um, <clears throat> and when I, when I say not being properly emotionally nurtured, I'm saying not receiving the validation, the emotional support that I needed, whether it be for a job well done, such as a, uh, a, something with sports, uh, something with my report card. Mm -hmm. uh, and when I would look out into the audience, per se, dad wasn't there. Mm -hmm. Mom was working two jobs, so sometimes mom wasn't there. Um, so that little guy in me grew up with this need for that, for that emotional support. All the while, growing up with a low self-esteem, you know, mm -hmm. and that self-esteem would then become dependent on you to help me feel better about me. Yes. Right. Mm -hmm. Because as long as you were supporting me and you could be the most unhealthiest of people. Any support would have been better than no support. That part, yeah. You know? Yes. 100%. I'm going to piggyback mm -hmm. on that because it was very similar. Can I pause you there real quick? Yeah. <clears throat> um, I love your attentiveness and your listening, your active listening. It's on point. Thank you. What, 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 but you're doing the, the mm hmm, yeah. <laughs> you know, like when he's. He just brings it out. I of know. Me. And it, nor, in normal conversation makes all the sense in the world, but in the editing world, it sucks. So please don't do that anymore. <laughs> <laughs> See, I'm not codependent. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to tell you how it is. I love it. It's All right. Sorry. Well, with that statement right there, I'm definitely anyone who knows me and even my clients, even sponsees, friends will tell you, I'm going to tell it like it is person. You are very. And it's you a, know that. But I'm going to tell you, getting back to this lack of self-esteem, lack of self-worth. Oh, my God. I could never. I could not. I was not that direct. I was not that assertive. The work that I did on myself has brought that out of me because I needed to learn how to execute healthy boundaries. And that meant that I was going to have to not only advocate for myself, but I was going to have to tell you how your behavior was affecting me. And I would avoid confrontation like the plague because if I had confronted you, per se, on something that was causing me to feel some kind of way, as they say... I was so fearful of, uh, were you going to still like me? What were you going to think about me if I had to confront you in a healthy way, of course, about something that was bothering me, you know? Yeah. It, it, when you get into the codependency, it, it has all these insidious tentacles that just go everywhere when you really start looking at it. Yeah, it's almost like <clears throat> the, there's different behaviors that come out as a result of that wound. And I know for me, with the work I've done as well, it it's not anything that I was I could put words to it. It was just how I was mm -hmm. until I started to do some work in Al-Anon, my steps in therapy, and realizing codependency rooting from an internal wound from childhood. And as a result, my behaviors and the way that I showed up in my relationships with people was from that space in, like you said, confrontation, being able to assertively say, this hurt me, or say, this is what I'm not going to accept. It was, I'd rather not rupture that attachment and sacrifice myself just because I was afraid of what that reaction might be. And that was also rooted from childhood. I mean, it was... I learned to keep it all in. I learned to please. That's another tentacle, if you will, of codependency is people pleasing and showing up in the way that I think you want me to show up in order for me to feel loved and validated and accepted. And so it's you, when you read literature on codependency, you're going to find a plethora of different definitions. And I love it that it can that what you said it conceptualizes where it comes from and what it is because i think if we can identify okay it comes from this wound it comes from these experiences that we internalized then we can look at the behaviors that come from that and make adjustments mm -hmm. but it's i call it i tell clients this all the time it's like whack-a-mole codependency doesn't just go away it 
you know, I think it, it tends to pop up. And even to this day, I have to, me and Ben are close friends outside of here. Is it okay if I say that, right? Of course. <laughs> and so, you know, there's times where I notice it and I need my friends to call me out and say, Nicole, this is what's happening here. Okay, let me look at that. So I just, I, the reason I'm saying that is because to give the pressure off of people to say like, oh, I'm going to get rid of this and it's going to go away forever. It's going to come up again, but then we just reevaluate it and then look at it from there. But yeah. And you know, there were people often will tell you, Oh, codependency is caring too much for others or, um, giving advice when, when it's not warranted, um, people pleasing, et cetera. Those are symptoms of codependency, the behaviors that you're referring to. Right. But when you, but it is a wound, You know, and it's a deep wound. And that wound is also birthed in my abandonment wound, right? And so when my dad left when I was eight years old, there was a a space on my soul, Mm -hmm. right? And I spent many years trying to fantasize about dad being here when dad couldn't be. I wanted dad to show up in a way that I wanted, that I needed but I had to come through my own therapy in my adulthood to realize dad was just not emotionally capable and he never was going to be able to show up the way that I needed him or wanted him to show up. So I had to look at the men that I had in my life, my grandfather, my uncle, mm-hmm. who were a father for me in every other way that I, in every way that I needed and wanted. But I was so wrapped in the codependency of still trying to cling to my father and go to this empty well that he was never going to fill, you know? And I sought that out in other relationships and it didn't even have to be romantic, right? Because anytime I felt that there was that discord or that, that potential that someone was going to leave me, Mm -hmm. I would go right back to that wound And this is something that I explain to the clients when I do groups on codependency, that the abandonment doesn't know any time or space. It just knows that it's the abandonment. And I can go back to being that little kid in those moments when I, when that wound is re-triggered. And that's exactly it. It's the way I explain that is when a different way, same thing is how the body and brain remembers the feeling, even Mm. though it might be a different external experience because it feels the same. And so before um, working on this, and we see this with our clients all the time, where whether it's friendships or romantic relationships, because that wound is still there and we aren't aware of it or it's subconsciously driving us, I can say this for me. I mean, any attention, I would take it on. And if you look back at my history of dating, God help me. I mean, my poor mother. Um, But I wasn't, I didn't have the worth. I didn't have the worth because I was, I was basing my worth on the receiving of love and validation from other people. And I can see it in my friendships. I could see it in relationships. And as a result, I would end up staying in toxic situations longer just so that I wouldn't have to feel that abandonment, just so I wouldn't have to feel the wound. And so... 100%. Let me ask something. What's... How does... Like, okay, so somebody's listening to this right now and they're, you know, hearing a lot about abandonment and stuff like that. How? What are some characteristics of codependency amongst, like, a family dynamic? Mm. Hmm. I think when we talk about enabling, I think that that is definitely goes along those lines of codependency. Now, of course, me being an addict and an alcoholic in my act of addiction, I didn't know, but let me, I can assure you that I manipulated and orchestrated things to get what I wanted because I would prey on their emotional dependency of me, meaning I knew they loved me and I knew that they would do for me. So I call that emotionally blackmailing these family members, my family members into giving me, doing for me what I wanted them to either give me or do for me. 
Yeah, and then the family members, as a result of a lot of times what we see is that they're not okay unless the person, their loved one, addict, alcoholic, if they're not okay, they're not okay. If they're okay, then they're okay. And so if they're struggling, it's counterintuitive. We say this to moms especially. It's counterintuitive to what a parent quote unquote, should do, protect their child and all of that. But it becomes an extreme where then they're not allowing that person to go through the natural consequences of addiction in order for them to learn. And really, they're doing it because they don't feel okay. If we're going to be really honest, it's because they don't feel okay if their child isn't okay. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm sitting here and I'm remembering, and that's a really good question, Tom, that you asked because I'm going back through my memory bank, and I can remember my grandmother, who was my world, right? I I loved my grandmother, and I knew that she loved me too, but my grandmother was the epitome of codependency. This was a woman who grew up in an alcoholic home. Her parents were alcoholic. She had all the isms, but never picked up alcohol. So she was a raging codependent. And her love, she her love language was gift gift giving of any kind and cooking and giving monetary or material gifts. But if there was a problem in school, whether I was, I could be the one that was at fault. She'd co-sign that to all living hell, (laughs) all living hell. And I, and, and I would be looking at her in amazement, secretly doing somersaults inside like, yeah, Graham, I, my biggest cheerleader, but at the same time, sitting here today as an adult man, man, I'm saying she would co-sign the hell out of all my shitty behavior, <laughs> which, I mean, didn't do anything for me uh, except, you know, it didn't teach me a valuable lesson. And that would go into colli- – she'd get into collision with my mom who was like, what are you doing? <laughs> you know, and I would see all this unhealthy dysfunction – all around my grandmother's codependency. I couldn't see it then as clearly as I see it today, you know? And that's just one example. I could give you several others from my from where it looks like in the family system. I just thought of two, actually. Can I say this real quick? Yeah. So how I've seen two, this again, tentacles of codependency. It can look different in different ways, right? Mm-hmm. With different family members and dynamics. But I've seen this where I'm thinking of a family in my mind now where the overprotective helicopter controlling parent comes from fear, comes from wanting to see their child do well, but it's overdone so that they can't, they're not learning from natural consequences. I've also seen where a parent then parentifies their child and that they're meeting their emotional need. That's another way of codependency. Give an example of that. So I've had clients where, for example, um, they were always the emotional uh, sounding bar for that parent. The parent would overly uh, express what's going on with intimate details of their life to their child, Mm. creating a dynamic where the child becomes parentified in a role that doesn't belong to them. So it's a lack of boundaries between the parent and the child. I can piggyback on that. I've had clients as well where particularly, let's say the mom or the dad is the identified addict or alcoholic, or maybe they have a medical illness or they have a mental health illness. They're in the home physically, but they're not involved in the goings and the happenings. And particularly one, the child then becomes this parental figure for the parent because they're having to quote unquote take care of, you know, um, and then they're feel then that individual feels this over protective need to take care of. And that's generally where we, where it starts to begin. I want to go back to your example with your grandmother Mm -hmm. and something that stuck out in my head. And I want to use this as an example because um, this is how one's addiction. And I don't know how old you were and you were in school. So probably like middle school It's definitely before high school. Yeah. So let's assume that grandma catches or the school catches you smoking pot in the bathroom. Grandma comes in. She bails you out. 
Oh, my Benji, he wasn't smoking <laughs> weed in the bathroom. That was the other kid. Yada, yada, yada. However that works out. The codependency behavior, and I guess the point I'm trying to make is it only takes one. It, it, it can take one addict and one codependent to totally destroy a family. And the reason I thought of this is because what you said, you said your grandma would co-sign everything. She was a quintessential codependent, like poster child for codependency. And your mom's over here saying, what are you doing? The triangulation that that causes. And then, you know, hypothetically speaking, your dad's in the picture. Mom's now going to dad. Now it's, it's, it's you and grandma versus mom and dad. And then maybe mom and dad goes to the brother or the sister or the brother and the sister says, you know, it's crazy what, you know, Ben gets away with and we're over here. And because maybe grandma likes you more than the other two. And then the other two are getting, you know, uh, the parents are taking out their frustrations with you and grandma on the other children. And it all stems back to you getting caught smoking weed in the bathroom and grandma being extremely codependent on you. That's what came up in my head just with that example of really two people can cause this, you know, fury amongst the family. And that I think that happens on on many different levels, different degrees amongst every family dynamic in some capacity. And if you don't think that codependency is involved in your family dynamic, then maybe you are like maybe you you are the codependent one. I don't know, but it's mm-hmm. there. And mm-hmm. so anyways, that's what I wanted to say. No, I think that's exactly I think that's an excellent example. Um I, I'm thinking of some clients that have this this type of dynamic with their parents and one of the things that I always bring up for them is how's the relationship with your parents? And nine times out of 10, you will always hear the client talk about how there's tension between mom and dad. There's this whole good cop, bad cop thing happening. One parent is trying to execute healthy boundaries while the other one is doing the complete undermining of that. And it just creates, like you said, this, very unhealthy dynamic and yeah like we talked about it has tentacles it does and then like and then one of the result another behavior if you will if it this we were doing a giant you know chart with like Mm -hmm. tentacles coming down where if there's tension in the home in that situation um you know a lot of times what i've noticed is then the emotions become internalized And so there's no healthy discussion, which is why with Family Weekend, when we do that and the family sit down and and read their impact letters and the person in treatment reads theirs, it's such a beautiful moment because they're communicating in a healthy way with things that were the elephants in the room that it was never discussed because everyone tends to internalize their own emotions and they're just being reactionary. And so a lot of times, for example, like the parentification one, right? Um, there's a or like if they're taking care they're almost like a caregiver for the parent in some capacity emotionally or physically they end up internalizing all of that and then they're afraid to share how they feel because of the the fear of the rupture of the attachment with the parent and so a lot of times we get clients who have never talked about how they felt in this in the in the home when there's tension in the home like that there's no room to feel safe or vulnerable enough to be transparent and honest about what's going on internally and let's be honest, most of us, I can say for me, well, I wasn't taught that. Yeah. I had to learn that. You know, it's interesting, too, because I'm sitting here and I'm remembering there have been moments in groups um, that I've done where you'll hear the clients start to talk about their relationship with the parent, right? And then they start to censor themselves. Yeah. Right? And I'll in I'll interject and I'll say, Mom's not here. But in their mind, while they're processing, she might as well be sitting right in the room. That's codependency. You know? And I'll have to point that out. Yes. And then mm-hmm. they'll look bewildered when they look at me and they're like, hmm. Yeah, because you are censoring, you're neglecting 
to process, share how you feel, right? Because they feel guilty. Yes, and I, that's where I tell them, you acknowledging your experience is not a betrayal to your parent. Correct. And parents do the best. We humans do the best with what we know. It's still okay to acknowledge what that experience was. And I'll even share this as a personal. I'm going to go in a little personal, too, with my own experience where um, my mom and I had a very codependent relationship. It was very enmeshed growing up. And her working on herself and me working on myself, setting boundaries, being able to talk to her has actually made our relationship 10 times healthier than it ever was. And she actually, in doing some or her own introspection, she told me, Nicola, one day I want you to be able to sit down and tell me everything that you felt as a result of your experience. It's okay if it hurts my feelings. I can take care of my feelings. I want you to be able to get that out if you ever need to. That's something very rare, <laughs> and I'm very grateful that my mom was able to say that, but I think she's realized how much that did to me growing up and allowing me to be able to have that space to say it. Usually that doesn't happen with the parent itself. Mm -hmm. That's why we have therapy and all of that. But um, there's a lot that gets put away because if I'm going to say for me, because I always put my mom on a pedestal. And so if I say these things, then it means that she's not that, but that's not the case. It doesn't mean I don't love her. It just means this is how I felt. Yeah, and that guilt feeling that we're talking about, mm -hmm. I think fosters unhealthy attachments. Yes, for sure. You know, and what I've noticed is through my own work and professionally as well is that this unhealthy attachment was fostered in the childhood only for the adult to then have an unhealthy attachment, say, in romantic relationships. I make the comment often where it's like your picker is broke and the clients <laughs> will laugh about that. My picker was broke for a long time because I confuse love with any attention. Yes. Mm -hmm. And so I would be seeking that out to fill the God space hole in my addiction and in my recovery. I think it, even, I think it mushroomed more in my recovery than it did in my act of addiction because I was so anesthetized with drugs and alcohol that I didn't really put much effort into romantic relationships because I was too busy self-medicating. But once the drugs and the alcohol, the substances were removed, this codependency all of a sudden came lurking out of the shadows. I had this need to, oh, I'm healthy now, let's have a healthy relationship only to find that I was picking the wrong ones because I didn't really know me. I didn't even still was trying to figure out who am I in early recovery. And that just catapulted me into all sorts of unhealthy behavior with unhealthy people all under this disguise that I'm sober now and I know what I'm, I know right. I, or that I deserve this. I deserve to be happy because I've been miserable for so long Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. Yeah. What any other BS excuse that I would tell myself, but I really had much more work to do. I had to complete the twelve steps. I had to get into therapy, <clears throat> where I did deep codependency work and inner child work, and that's where the connection was made with codependency. That it was a family of origin issue. You and know? one of the things that you told me, which is actually something I practice still is what if I know I'm in a place where I'm, I know my body now, right? And my signs. So if I know I'm at a place where I could be triggered easily, I envision my little girl at home in a place that's safe. And my adult self comes in and says, you're safe. You're staying here. I'm going to take care of us and I'm going to go to work or I'm going to go do this. And it's this like uh, meditative uh, visualization that has really helped me. And that's something that we've talked about and I use it all the time. Yeah. You know, I really, because what I learned is that the lack of self-worth that I had and the lack of self-esteem that I had 
was due to the fact that my little kid was still wounded. That was a part of the wound. And that if I could form a relationship with him and build him up and affirm him, hence the emotional nurturing that we were talking about, then the adult self can then reparent the little kid the way that the the little kid need, needed it, the way that I needed it, right? Right, mm-hmm. right. And to go to, you know, when you start learning how to communicate boundaries through code, working on codependency, it, that's a form of taking care of self and that, that inner child as well. Because growing up, you know, there weren't any boundaries. And so I remember one time, and I'm sure she won't mind if I share this because it might help someone else, but... I remember I was on the phone with my mom and I I set a boundary with her. And I said, you know, mom, I think it's better that we don't talk about these things. And I encouraged her to maybe seek help for that and who she could talk to, right? And I sensed her mood shift after that. And I got off the phone. And of course, I started breaking down and my all my shit came out. This is why I don't say anything. This is why I don't speak my mind, why I assertively don't communicate, because I was taking on her reaction as a way to say that what I did was wrong. But then once I let it out, I allowed my teenage self to kind of kick and scream for a little bit and cry. I was able to pause and really look at that and say, you know what? Mom's an adult. Her emotions are not my responsibility. She can manage them. I can still set a boundary for me, and it's okay. That I'm going to tell you this. A week later, she hands me a letter, and she's like, Nicole, I want you to read this when you're on your own. So I did, and she wrote me this whole letter apologizing. And she said, I realized how much you were parentified as a child. I didn't even use that word. She went online and started researching it. And it just it makes me choked up just talking about it because it was a moment where I felt seen. And it taught me that maybe as difficult as it was to set a boundary with somebody that I was always there for emotionally, parentified, it was a good thing because it was protecting me, but it was also showing her an account, almost like an accountability. And so it was helpful for me and for her because I was showing up authentically and it helped her to see her part. So um, I guess I share that because there is always fear in being able to, especially with a parent, to set a boundary. But it's important for us to learn how to have a voice for the child that didn't. 100%. Yeah. Because if I don't communicate how I feel, I was so resentful as a result. Yes. And I didn't, you know... And that word gets tossed around a lot, too. Oh, resentful. And everyone always thinks it's it's attached to the fourth step, right? Right, right. However, resentments that I had for myself for saying yes when I really wanted to say no, you know? Yes. Or Mm -hmm. not sharing how I felt and and then feeling inadequate as a result of not saying it when I would walk away. Because I knew that if I didn't share how I felt, it was only going to happen again, and I was going to have to be faced to say it again. And I, I, the internal dialogue around these things was renting so much space, you know, the guilt feelings for standing up for myself, um, the guilt feelings for not sharing how I felt when I really knew that I needed to share how I felt. All of that was just this it would just weigh me down. Yes. And it's, and then, you know, I fell trapped to martyrdom in Mm. that too, because I'm building all these resentments because I'm not speaking up for what I need, which is also a a, a reaction to trauma because growing up your, your parents, your caregivers see your Mm. need and meet them. But when that emotional need is not met, we grow up with that mentality that, well, you need to, well, how come you didn't see this? Well, no, it's up to me. I, it's I'm responsible for me. And so I fell victim to this mentality of like, I'm doing all this and I'm resentful of myself. I'm resentful to everyone around me, but I'm putting myself in that situation because I teach people how to treat me. Yep. That's it. Right. Right. Yep. So, mm-hmm. and even Tom, like even just this week, I, I went to Tom and Ben and we were talking about work stuff and 
I said, you know, I need help with this. Me five years ago would have never had that conversation with you because, you know, yeah. Yeah. I was just going to say, so when we talk about boundaries, I think it's important to point out that before I could start setting healthy boundaries, I first had to do the work, the internal work. Yes. I had to find out what was acceptable for me, what wasn't acceptable for me when we talk about behavior, right? And the only way I was going to do that is if I got to know myself. So I really couldn't just jump in and say, hey, I'm a codependent and here are my boundaries. I mean, what am I advocating for? Right. You know, without knowing who I am and what's important to me, what's not important to me. So there was a lot of internal work that had to happen before I could get to a point to figure out what was important and what did what did I want my healthy, what did I want? my relationships to look like in other words what 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 did it mean to me when i heard the term healthy relationship you know what right. did that and what did i want that to to embody <laughs> it's like knowing what your values are 100%. and being able to identify that and i give this metaphor to clients so when you go to the louvre in france and you go look at the mona lisa can you go up to the mona lisa and touch it no and <laughs> why because there's security and it's protected because it's something precious and and timeless and valuable. We're no different. I love that. That goes along. <laughs> so you and I are very much alike. So what I tell the clients is that when you go window shopping, mm-hmm. okay, what do you see when you go walking down Rodeo Drive or Worth Prada, Avenue? Prada, darling. You see all these different boutiques <laughs> with all these different windows. Well, what's in the window? And then they say, the merchandise that's sold inside. I said, exactly, because it's attracting you to come in, right? So therefore, what are you putting in your window? Because what you put in your window is what you're going to attract. I love that. Mm-hmm. So, oh, I love it, that. So, if you don't like what you're attracting, then perhaps you need to look at what your you're merchandise. Putting, correct. <laughs> you need to look at yourself. Yeah, you're and selling some off brand stuff, generic, that's right. cheap stuff, maybe yeah. stuff that's been off the rack. It's or Brada, what, not Prada. Used. <laughs> used and abused. Used and abused. Yeah. Right. And so that ties into when I say, you know, water seeps its own level. So, if you're attracting, People in your life that are taking advantage of you or using, you know, abusing you or mistreating you in any shape, way or form, not validating you, that's what you're putting in your window because perhaps you're not doing that for you. Right. And that goes to a beautiful point that I just thought about with like toxic relationships, right? Kind of going into that where when I was in this relationship with somebody who was an alcoholic for five years and I... I, it was like the poor me's and like, why is this happening? And I was like, when I went into Al-Anon and did my steps, I, it made me realize, wait a minute, no one held a gun to my head and told me you need to stay in this relationship. I had to take a look at myself. What was it? What was my part? What was it that I was putting out in my window? What was it that I was accepting and wasn't accepting? Because I have control over that. I didn't have control over what he did, said, or, or what have you, but I had control over me. Yeah, my work brought me full circle. I had a full circle moment. In other words, I was using drugs and alcohol to self-medicate. And I didn't know that that's what I was doing. I like the effects produced, right? Right. Part of that was I was the last person I wanted to look at. So if I could escape me, escape my feelings, numb my feelings, escape my problems, that was great. Then we remove the drugs and alcohol, get sober, and life is kind of good for a while. And then it's like, er, not so, because then all this codependency stuff starts coming up. And guess who I have to look at? Me. Yourself. The yeah. same person that I was trying to run away from, only to come all the way around the bend back to me, but with a new and improved love, newfound love for myself. Yes. So in other words, I don't necessarily regret it. I'm glad that I dis- it was a self-discovery because – through that process is where my confidence has come from. People, you know, my friends, colleagues, they're like, Ben, you know, you're so forward. You, you, you know, you, you do it. So, even clients will say, you know, you, you have such a polite way of saying fuck you without yeah. saying fuck you. <laughs> and, and I'm like, 
I, and I don't even realize that I'm doing it. But what I've come to realize is that's just the testament to good therapy and to, to my love for myself that I didn't know that I needed or wanted, but I'm so grateful that I found. Yes. And that's a testament to your healing and your yeah. growth. Mm -hmm. And you know, I can relate to that with relationships. That's a, yes. the same thing for me. Get outside of self, filling that void. Then when I was alone, well, oh shit, I'm there with me and my, all my issues. <laughs> so I got to look at that. And, you know, and I have to piggyback on that and say that it's so true. You have such an impact on our clients and on, I'm going to say on me too. I've known Ben since I was an intern back in 2015, 2016. And I always looked up to Ben and said, oh my gosh, I want to be like Ben when I grow <laughs> up. <laughs> and now we're friends and colleagues. So you mean the world to me and you've helped me so much as well, just on a personal level. You so. mean the world to me too. You really Aww. do. And, it, you know, I... The, conf the newfound confidence oftentimes, I don't know if you're dealing with this, can often be tra uh, confused with me being an asshole, right? And it's like, mm, no, I just know what I want and I know what I don't want. That's right. And I know what I like and what I, what I don't like. Therefore, I know what's acceptable to me and what's not. And I'm going to be polite and respectful about it. And I'm going to let you know my boundaries, yes. you know? Um, but that was never the case. Oh, my God. I would cringe. The cr When my therapist used to say to me, well, you're going to have to give that person a boundary, I, I would cringe inside. Yes. And it's like a they, visceral response. Yeah. I don't have that visceral response anymore. Yeah. It gets so it's much freeing. easier. It's freeing. And it builds connection. Yeah, 100%. You know, and this goes into our friendships and our romantic, our our romantic partners, husbands, wives, when you can sit with somebody and say, when this happened, it made me feel this way. Mm -hmm. And they are healthy too, where they can receive it. Their yep. ego's checked. My ego's checked. They can hear what where I'm coming from and I can hear where they're coming from. It builds connection. And that was something that I didn't understand when I started this journey. Same. That actually setting boundaries, having those uncomfortable conversations – builds closeness in any relationship, work relationships. And that's why we see the beauty in the impact letters full circle back to that because they're being vulnerable in communicating their boundaries, communicating how they feel, and it builds connection. We have clients leave family weekend saying, I never had a conversation like that with my family my entire life. Yeah. You know, we we have also clients who leave family weekend and regret not saying not doing it, not not doing it, or mm -hmm. they leave family weekend and then they say, "I wish I had said more." You know, true. And and I I have to look at that and I say, well, I ask them very matter of factly. Then why didn't why didn't you? Oh, you know, I just feel like sometimes some <laughs> things are meant for a private session and should not have and. See, and I'm a firm believer that having gone through similar experiences where I should have said something and didn't, what I've now have come to, to practice in my life, and I've been doing it for a long time, is sometimes things are happening organically for a reason, and you have to kind of go with what's happening. Yes. And if it's, ha and so I, I explained to them if something's happening in those moments, in those, when you're in that family group, you got to just let it happen. There is a magic that's happening yes, that if you are not in that setting, you probably are not going to have that moment again. Right. So you have to seize the moment yes. when it's happening. And, and in, that being said, too, one of the things I also learned is when I didn't have the ability to seize the moment, when I didn't have the ability to... um. Let me rephrase that. I had the ability. I didn't have the awareness that I had or the tools. Mm -hmm. I give myself compassion for that, Nicole, because I didn't know. I knew with I was doing the best with what I had at the time. So one of the things I've noticed with clients and even myself in therapy, I'm still in therapy. I'm very open about that because Lord knows I don't know everything and I'm still learning and growing and healing that. Um, oh, well. Now that I know that, I look back and I should have had those conversations. I should have done this. See, it's I didn't. Shaming. For me, I knew what to say in those moments, but fear 
ruled me. And fear, putting it. fear would not allow me to say oftentimes what I know I needed to say. And those are those times where I was referring to earlier where I'd walk away feeling either guilty or resentful. Not resentful with the person, but resentful with me for not saying what I know I should have said. Right. Only for it to continue to rent space in my head and set me up again to feel the same way again. And so I say that to say that I kept, I got tired of being in that proverbial merry-go-round. And that's when I was like, okay, well, what am I going to do about this? If I want change, I have to elicit that change. So therein lies where my real work began, you know? And freedom. You know, I, I inherit, I really believe that through suffering and uncomfortability is the greatest lessons. Mm -hmm. Um, and walking through it, it's not in the absence of fear, it's in spite of it and having the courage to, to face your own demons and, and look at these things and, and do what's uncomfortable. I've never once came out of a situation where I was doing something uncomfortable, knowing my intention was good for me and walked away saying I shouldn't have done that. And even if the reaction wasn't what I wanted it to be, because yeah. I grew from it regardless. And I think it's important that if, if we're going to have this conversation, what's coming up for me as well is if there is someone listening who is questioning whether, they, whether he or she is codependent, I think that that already is telling in and of itself. Yes, that's true. You're not going to question it if you don't think that you already are. There has Some of this conversation must be resonating with you. Then the other thing that I would say to that person is, and this is something that I tell the clients as well, because like, like our friend here, they'll say, oh, I'm not codependent, but my, <laughs> but my wife is codependent. And then my, my comment to them emphatically is, you can't be in a one-sided relationship with that part, codependent. Yeah. If, you're, if your significant other, family member, child, what have you, is codependent, <clears throat> so are you. Yes, that's now, very true. you're codependent in a different way than they are, but nevertheless, that's a codependent relationship. You got your dynamic of codependency, and they have their dynamic of codependency. Codependency isn't a one-sided coin. It's definitely not. And to and to add to that, I would even say to them that to take away the stigma in naming something, there's power and value in that. So if for the person that's like, oh, I don't want to be labeled as codependent, like, oh, am I codependent? Call it for what it is, because then you have the power to do something about it. There's power in giving our emotions and our experiences language. Before so long, and I don't know if you can relate to this, I, I was going through life in this codependent way without having the language to identify what it was. It was just my normal. That's it. And when I named it, I could call it out. Okay, now I can, I can work on this because I can see it. It's no different than when I had to identify myself as an addict and an alcoholic. Exactly. I, it, once I started owning that, it took away its power. I mean, of course, I had to do other the steps the and work. other things to do the work. But I agree with you. I think once I put things into the light, it loses its power. Light dispels the darkness. Yes. It's you like know? Brene Brown. I love her. Oh, my yes. gosh. But she talks about how, um, what was it? Shame. So there's shame in not naming something and keeping it in the dark. And there's three things that grow it exponentially if you put it in a Petri dish. Silence, judgment, and secrecy. How do you kill it? You douse it with empathy. In order to bring it empathy, you have to bring it to light. And most people can identify with these emotions and human experiences, regardless of where you're from in the country, regardless of skin color and socioeconomic background. It's a human. All these things we're talking about, in essence, are a human experience. And I think when we have these vulnerable conversations, it just takes away the stigma and all all of that it's we're all just human trying to do the best we can that's it that's <laughs> it you know you know and uh, you know you said something i'm you know i'm still in i mean i'm still in therapy um after having not been in therapy for a long time you know um and when when i say that that's not to say oh i'm some like broken defect defective person no it's about 
what I've come to learn is self-love. I love myself yes. enough to continue to do the work, to peel away the layers, because when things come up, I, I have learned now in my recovery to take a look at it. Yes. It's happening organically. I'm feeling this or I'm feeling that. I'm thinking this or I'm thinking that. And those, that's my intuition. You know, we've talked about, yes. you and I have talked mm -hmm. about that through the cows come home about how strong our intuition is. Mm -hmm. And so I've come to learn to trust that intuitive voice. And I've been now in therapy for the last two years, but there has been long stretches where I wasn't in therapy. I'm Same. all, I'm, you know, mm -hmm. um, part of how the, what we're talking about here today, I, I've spent three and a half years doing a deep dive into my trauma, my in, inner, inner child work, and my, my codependency. And I have to tell you, there is no, those things are no longer threatening the life inside of me. Mm. There is an internal peace there now that I am totally like ready and willing to sit on a podcast like this, have an open discussion about, because I am no longer judging myself. I am no longer in pain. And if my if my mess can be turned into a message for someone that's listening to this, then my my job here today is done. That's how I feel you know? about it too. You know, and I think that's a testament to the work you've done and and the work I've done. I'm gonna give myself a little one hundred percent credit because I wouldn't have sat here and talked about this years ago. Oh, I would have been oh so God. fearful. The world is going to see <gasps> They're this. They're going to know. Are, what are they going to yeah. think about me? Right. I, I've, got, yeah. <laughs> I've got clients that are going to be looking at this. What are they thinking? Right. Uh, um, oh, my God. You know, I'm a sober person. I'm, my sponsees are supposed. I've come to learn. A very wise person told me that's the best thing that you could share is your journey. Yes. And, 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 and with the clients especially yep. because they can foresee bullshit. When they, they see it, they know it. Yep. There's moments where I walk in and I'll tell them, I had a shitty day today. I'm so sorry. If you see me this way, it's not mm -hmm. you guys. It's where I'm at. But we're going to make the best of this group today. Or this is my experience. Mm -hmm. I'm still in therapy. My degrees don't mean <laughs> shit. Yeah, it's something I'm, I'm proud of. I worked for it. But it doesn't make me any better than anybody I serve. Yep. It, you know, I think it's important that as therapists, especially, we don't put ourselves on that pedestal. That's it. It's, it's about we, showing mean, the humanity. That part. You know, like, it's just about showing humanity. I tell them all the time, listen, just because I have time or just because I'm older or just because I have experience doesn't mean that I'm any further along. We're all still trying to do this thing called life. I know, that's you know? right. And if I can show you what worked for me or my parts of my story and journey that can benefit you, I'm going to. Then we did our job. Then I did my job, exactly. But those were things that I used to be so ashamed of. Me too. Me like, too. Oh my God, I am not going to share with you X, Y, Z, like a laundry list of things. Oh, <laughs> for sure. For you, sure. You know, I've come on this podcast. I've talked about internalized homophobia. Today I'm talking about codependency. <laughs> I mean, how you many know, times you've been on now? Three? This is, this is my third, third time. Third. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and I enjoy coming back. I enjoy, it's not that I enjoy talking about myself. Let's not get that twisted. <laughs> it's still, in, it's still uncomfortable. I do it because I know that someone's going to listen. And yeah. if I have something to offer, then that's it. You know, it's not that, oh, look at me. You know. Well, right. And talk about giving little you a voice. Absolutely. And other you know, little use out there. All the little use. use. <laughs> and I, the clients make fun of me because I'll look at them and I'm like, I see their inner child when I see yep, them. Me too. You know, and I just, that's where my counter transference comes in. We've talked about this where mm -hmm. I get like protective of that. Yeah. You know, but um, I think we all have that. We grow up, we change biologically, we get older, um, but we all have that innocence and that, that purity. We forget to get in touch with that and and our and and, the, and i think you know, it's important it's, as a professional right as us being professionals mm -hmm. that professionals need help too right that yes and that we're caregivers and we mentioned that term earlier in terms of codependency and i don't want anyone out there thinking that you can't be a caregiver 
there is there is a healthy balance between being a caregiver and then overextending oneself. Meaning, right. And I did that. I overextended and didn't know what my own boundary was. So boundaries are not always for others. As boundaries and limits are for myself too. So I'm sure there might be someone out there thinking, well, look at these two. They're talking about <laughs> codependency, but they're therapists, they're caregivers. So they're codependent. Well, yeah, which probably makes us more effective. Right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Touche, yeah. But at the same time... <laughs> I have had to put limits and balance uh, and boundaries yes. around how invested am I going to become in another person's outcome? Right, and that's the, the yes, and you know, and but boundaries I needed with to, that. Uh, yeah, because I needed to do my codependency in order to figure out what my limit was. What are in 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 inversely <clears throat> are my limit as well, but also knowing that people have a right to their process. So if I'm doing something that they can do for themselves, then what that's a boundary I'm crossing. So it's that fine line of boundaries for self, also boundaries for them and they're allowed to their process. Mm -hmm. And you know, it's funny because some, you know, it's no secret that I've have this reputation for being like a sour patch kid. (laughs) I'm sour at first and some, then I'm sweet later. Right. (laughs) <laughs> and 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 that's okay, right? Yeah. It's, I'm not everybody's flavor, but I say that to say that even when I'm being stern, I'm being loving. Yes. And I think that what happens is that oftentimes people confuse that. And they think that someone's being stern, they're not being loving. No, I'm being loving enough to tell you, but you need to hear it in a firm way. Because I had a client ask me that once. They're like, well, how come you're like sweet with this one over here, but you're like stern with me? And I'm like, because I don't think you would respond if I was soft. Mm -hmm. And they started laughing. They're like, you know, I think you're right. I said, I happen to know that I am right. (laughs) (laughs) And I don't say that to boast. It's just, I think people respond differently to different styles. And it's it's discernment of it's discernment, yeah. of, of knowing who can handle and what they can handle where they're at, and and I and I I told them I said obviously if someone is really fragile, you don't think I'm you think I'm going to be as stern with someone who's fragile? I said absolutely not. You're going to see a warm, tender, loving person come out of me because that's what that per- that's where that person is at in their journey. And I even would say that you, when you are being more straightforward, it is like to your point, it is loving and nurturing. And that's something I had to learn too, that when I set a boundary, there's love in that for myself mm-hmm. and for the other person, because then I'm showing up authentically. And when you, when you people please, it's the number one form of manipulation. Absolutely. And so if I'm people pleasing, I'm not only betraying that person and f- pretending <laughs> that they're getting a v- version of me that's not real, but then I'm betraying myself. Mm -hmm. so in being assertive and and doing that there's love in that yeah yeah well tom any one hour (laughs) and i didn't have to say anything (laughs) so that worked out perfect it's gonna be an iconic (laughs) yeah episode uh ben thank you for coming on thank you for having me very uh educated on codependency obviously playing out in your own life and it's done worked wonders for you working through all that stuff and and for thank the you. record the reason you've been on here three times is because you add value thank you i yeah. appreciate that tom yeah thank so, you and nicole it's because you work here like and you're always around and it's you know so <laughs> Thanks, it's like, all, right. all right come on nicole <laughs> oh great thank you i'm just kidding how I'm many times you've been on two or three like four four yeah So, no, two very bright individuals here. And, uh, you know, hey, listen, I do not pretend to know everything, hence why I didn't say anything here. (laughs) You guys did a very good job at describing codependency and uh, what to look out for and how to handle it. So appreciate both of you. I appreciate you. you. Thank you. All right. That is it for this episode of Real Recovery Talk. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for tuning in in the end if you have any comments questions or concerns you can always reach us info at realrecoverytalk.com again that's info at realrecoverytalk.com and ultimately we want to help you turn your mess into your message that is it we will see y'all later